Welcome, Gun Runner. Everybody, Kieran AK the Laird here, and I've got another system review and overview for you. And today we're going to be looking at the Atari 2600 Junior, as you can see right here. And what I've done here is I've also got its um, big brother, the very first model of the 2600, simply known as the Video Computer System or VCS. That's um, my lovely six switch model, which has actually featured on the cover of Retro Gamer magazine. So uh, yes, my um, old VCS is famous. And um, I've also got all three models here of the Junior, which we will go through um, in due course. Now, for those who don't know, this was the last model of the uh, 2600 that was released um, there was several different variations but it's all cosmetic there are no uh, hardware differences and there's no real hardware differences between this model and the original one actually the only thing was that they uh, reduced the number of chips used on the board so it's basically a cost reducing uh, measure to get it down to a smaller size and to make it cheaper pro to, to, to produce now everyone associates this model with uh, the junior with uh, Trammell Atari, Atari Corp, um, as it was. Um, but a lot of people don't realise that this model was actually conceived under Warner. There was already plans before um, Jack Trammell took over the Atari Consumer Division to launch the junior model. The designs had been done um, and uh, they had started to work on the circuitry and everything. So that the machine was pretty much already kind of ready to go. Uh, there was already this plan to, to, to launch it, so you'd have the 2600 as the budget model, the 7800 as the premium model, uh, to create you know a product range. So there was already this plan to do that. So when um, Trammell came in, he had a ready-made machine to go, and part of his early focus was to get this out on the market because he had nothing else really to sell. He was still working on the Atari ST, trying to get that up and running, uh, so we could get it get it launched because of course he wanted to get computers on the market he was clearing out the old uh, Atari 8 bit inventory and he was working on the new XE models which were going to replace the old XLs so he, he was still fighting with uh, Warner and uh, General Computer Corporation over the 7800 so that was that was held up massively um, it was always an intention to get that to market as soon as possible it wasn't like many people say, released just because they wanted to try and compete with the NES. Uh, from day one, there was always an intention to release the 7800 alongside the 2600 Junior, but legal wrangles over who owned the rights to it held that up. But that's a story for another video. We're looking at the 2600 Junior. So released in 1985, and um, I think in America, I think it was launched at $50. Um, in the UK, it was, I think it was originally £50, but it, it went down not before long to, to £40. I bought one when it was £40. So um, it, it went down, it did go down a bit lower than that, which, you know, was an absolutely tremendous bargain because it came with a game as well. Mine came with Centipede. They did various different packings uh, with the 2600. Probably the most famous one of all was the, the last packing they did was with the the 32-in-1 cartridge, which had 32 of the original old 2K games on one cartridge. And uh, it was quite clever because uh, how it operated was every time you switched it, the system on and off, it loaded a new game. So rather than having a menu or anything to select for, you kept turning it on, turning it off again, turning it on, turning it off again to get this um, to get this 32-in-1 cartridge uh, you know, to, to load the games. So it wasn't like a menu like you would expect to find on a multi-cart to select between the games. It was a case of just cycling the power to, to, to get different games. But it was quite clever. Obviously, very good value for money. I mean, 40 quid for a console with 32 games. And there was a lot of good games on there as well. I mean, there was even some Activision stuff on there. So uh, it was a really, really good selection of games. But I was pretty happy getting Centipede with it. Centipede was a cracking uh, conversion. Not the best graphically, but um, was an awful lot of fun to play. And uh, just a reminder, I'll actually stick in a little... 
uh, clip of uh, Centipede on the 2600 right here. Now, let's go into the, the system. So, obviously, as I said, cost reduced version of the, the, the old bigger 2600s. We had the wood grain version first, which you can see at the back there. And then we had the Vader afterwards, as it was called, that looked exactly the same, apart from it was all black. But the, the, the size was no different. It was still exactly the same size, uh, just as big and bulky. And what I'll do first of all is I'll grab this to show you the size difference between them. So here is my my big old woody, and if I stick it on top, you can see uh, considerably longer. Uh, it's considerably taller, as you can see, um, in 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 both ways. Um, so everything about it is is just generally much 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 larger. Than the. Yeah, much, much larger than, than the Junior. The Junior was a real, you know, it's probably half the size at least um, in terms of the uh, dimensions. But also it's much lighter. I mean, the, the old ones were known for being heavy. I mean, especially the original ones, the heavy sixes. And um, even the later ones were, were heavy because of all the metal shielding they had inside them. And this, these are actually really light. They feel like they've got nothing in them. It's amazing how light they are. Um, so that, that was a big a big difference there as well. Now, in terms of other physical differences, obviously the most notable things are the switches. So you power off, you've got this switch. So you've still got a switch like you did on the, the old um, Woody behind it. Um, you can probably just still see the switch in the background. You've got your black and white and colour switch. Not so important by the time the Junior came along because I think most people by then had colour TVs. Uh, not so many people were using black and whites, but uh, a lot of the later games actually that were specifically kind of designed and advertised alongside the, the 2600 Junior used this as a pause button um, or a menu button. I think uh, Secret Quest is something that springs to mind that uses, uses that switch. Um, I know there are others, but for some reason that game uh, sticks in my mind as being one of the ones that used it. There's also uh, your select button, but now that's like a push down button rather than being a, a, a switch. So you, you just push it to select. So it's slightly different because in the old one you kind of flicked it, and on this one it's a, a push down button. Uh, and same with reset, it's this kind of soft push down button um, instead. So what about difficulty switches? Well, they, as you might have seen along the, this writing on the top here, have been moved to the back. So I'll show you what the back looks like. So now we've got our two difficulty switches, left and right. Our power socket is in the middle. RF socket, there was no kind of uh, scar or monitor socket or anything like that. We just had we just had RF with the 2600, of course. It was designed for a CRT TV anyway. And this hole here, if you're American, you had a channel switch there. We didn't use channel switches um, in uh, Europe and uh, power regions. We just tuned it to the television. In America, they had this thing where... You had different channels, I think, to, that helped with the tuning, depending on where you lived in the country. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Americans. So there we go. And I'm going to go into this a little bit more at the moment, but you'll see on this, we've got, obviously, that's to stop it overheating. That's our kind of heat sink, so to speak, which is mostly the top of the original one. But you'll see this was produced in Ireland. And I've actually Atari Inc. by Atari Island Limited in Ireland. It's interesting that obviously it says manufactured Atari Inc. because it was actually Atari Corp. So that shows that these these were produced quite early um, because the intention was that these were being produced for Warner Atari. Um, 
who had a factory in Ireland, which they actually, originally, that factory was used to build arcade machines. And then that factory was actually sold uh, to Namco. Um, Namco obviously bought Atari games eventually, and uh, Namco used that factory for years to come. So they built loads of these in Ireland, and this model, this particular model with the black, all black, um, became known as the Black Irish. That's what people call it. Uh, so that's why, because it's the only model that was built in Ireland. All the rest were built in Asia. I think Hong Kong. I think the rest were built, but we'll have a look in a moment. So this is the the the, the rarest of the two thousand six hundred junior models, and I believe this is only PAL. I don't think there are any NTSC. Uh, juniors um, like this. I think the only black ones were PAL. I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure I'm right because of them being built in Ireland. So I, I think they're all built for the European market. But I love this. I think it looks really stylish. Um, even to this day, I just think there's a, a certain real style about it. I think it looks fantastic with that black strip. I actually preferred it to the chrome strip models. So there was two chrome strip models, so I'll show you those. Um, First of all, we have this one, which people tend to call the short rainbow because it only has this little kind of tiny little rainbow strip down the middle there. Um, but the logo is pretty much the same as it was on, on, on the black model. No other differences. It is just this this strip is now a, a chrome metal strip with um, the, the short little rainbow thing. Uh, let's have a look at the sticker on the back. So I've got the sticker. Yeah, Taiwan. There we go. I couldn't remember where these were built. I thought it was Hong Kong. It's not Taiwan. So there we go. So I think most of the American models look like this one, if I if I remember correctly. And finally, you have to excuse us because it's really beat up. But I thought I had one that wasn't beat up, but this was the only one I could find. And what you can see here is actually someone, for some reason, decided to take this strip off and then try and stick it back on again and did a really, really terrible job of it. <coughs> Excuse me. Because, obviously, they realised that it kind of all crumpled up when they tried to take it off. And then they tried to glue it back on, and they made a right mess of it. Um, and uh, this is also bashed up because this one got smashed in the post as well, so it's, it's in a really bad way. So, But that has the same um, uh, manufacturing place, Taiwan. And these are obviously unsurprisingly called the long rainbow so we had a short rainbow and a long rainbow and uh, i think these mostly are pal um the long rainbow ones um this was the model i had when i was a kid i had a long rainbow that was what i was looking for because i was pretty sure that i still have my original long rainbow junior in my garage but i went through quite a few boxes and could not find it but that's not to say it isn't there because there's a lot of stuff in my garage it is unbelievable um the amount of crates of retro gaming stuff that are in there. My intention at some point is to try and turn it into some sort of man cave, but um, I'm making quite slow progress uh, sorting through everything and getting it in uh, some sort of semblance of order again. Um, so let's go back. So there we go to our, to our nice one. And um, as I alluded to earlier, um, they, they with, with along with the relaunch of this, they actually relaunched lots of new software for this as well. Um, they did a new box design, which is red, very iconic, kind of dark red. And the box for the 2600 Junior, there was one box that was silver and there was another box that was dark red. Um, two different box types. I haven't got one here to show you, unfortunately. But the um, the... Red boxes were stood out really well on the shelf. They look they looked really great, and uh, I I might actually do a video uh, at some point. Actually, I'm planning to on the you know the the evolution of, of the box styles with the 2600 and what they look like. But I don't didn't want to sort of clog this video up with looking at those as well. So I'm aware that once I start going to that stuff stuff, 
uh, my videos can be quite long. But yes, on the adverts, um, there was a really, really classic advert. Um, in fact, sod it, I will stick that advert in here, the Funny's Back advert, so you can see that, because it was pretty cheesy and uh, pretty memorable. The fun is back, oh yes siree It's the 2600 from Atari It's the video system with classics galore From space invaders to cars that roar A real hip joystick controls the screen Solaris is hot and midnight magic's mean And one more thing, it's got a special low price Under 50 bucks 50 bucks? Now isn't that nice? The fun is back, oh yes siree It's the 2600 from Atari yeah, see, I told you, uh, I remember that advert being on TV over here, and uh, I think probably a lot of people remember that advert because it actually helped sell a hell of a lot of 2600s, and it featured lots of the new games that Atari had commissioned. So they did all sorts of new games. We had new sports games like Real Sports um, Boxing and Super Football, and then there was some really great stuff like um, Solaris, um, Easily for me the best game on the twenty six hundred. I will I will stick a, a killer for Solaris up at the end of this section actually, because uh, Solaris needs to be seen to be believed. They did loads and loads and loads of games actually, and they even in, not just did the, their own games. Uh, I mentioned Secret Quest earlier. There was Motor Rodeo. There was um, Akari Warriors was another big name title that Atari licensed and got out for the, for the, the junior. And released it for the 7800 simultaneously. They did have quite a few titles actually, like Dark Chambers was another one where they released a 2600 version and a 7800 version at the same time. I suppose it's quite good because it really showed the difference between the games. Desert Falcon actually is another notable one um, in that as well. But they also encouraged lots of third parties to release new games. Um, I think it helped that these were selling like hotcakes mainly because they were so cheap to buy. Activision jumped back in, released a load more games. So we got stuff for like for Activision, like Double Dragon, Commando, Rampage, you know, big arcade game licenses, Kung Fu Master, Ghostbusters 2. So Activision did a load of really good big name licenses um, late in the 2600s life. We also got um, River Raid 2 is another another great one that we got um, late in the life of the 2600. Um, you know, specifically designed really for the, the 2600 Junior. But often the later titles you'll see, they all have um, either stickers on or right, and that actually says for the Atari 2700 and 7800 to really push the backwards compatibility as well and kind of encourage people, I suppose, to upgrade to the, the 7800 from the 2600. And um, interesting fact here, I mean, as I said about these sold like hotcakes, they sold really well. And I remember Daryl Still, the former um, marketing manager at Atari UK, telling me that, that a large amount of these, certainly in the UK, and uh, especially were sold via catalogues, home shopping catalogues. So your mum would get those big, thick catalogues like uh, Grattan and um, Universal and Little Woods and all those ones. And a lot of them were sold by them because they were bought as Christmas presents or birthday presents, and uh, they were such good value. So they, you know, they they really pushed them through the catalogs, and that's actually where um, I first saw one of these. Actually, was what I showed my dad, and my dad didn't buy it from the catalog in the end; he bought it from Toys R Us. But I remember showing my dad in the catalog and saying, "Look, this is really cheap. I'd like one of these," because uh, you know, it was a recession. We were quite pushed for cash at the time, and. Um, it was probably about all we could afford back then, actually. Um, so yeah, and I had a lot of a lot of a lot of good times with with, with the twenty six hundred. Uh, I really did. And uh, I read a, a really interesting fact uh, in Ray's magazine that actually said that in nineteen ninety, the twenty six hundred and seventy eight hundred, and uh, I believe the XE game system as well. Those three consoles that they had out on the market accounted for over 50 percent of the uk console market think about that for a moment because you had the nes out you had the mars system out and i think the mega drive was 
not quite out it was about to come out so that's i mean when the mega drive came out it exploded so yeah it was just before the mega drive came out i i believe that that was that was printed I, i'm 99 percent sure in fact so you know that that's that's pretty massive because everyone talks about how great the master system was and how well the master system sold in the uk you know and what a big success it is but i think a lot of people forget that actually a lot of the master system success came after the mega drive was launched because the master system became the budget model they reduced it greatly in price i think you could get them for about 50 quid um so it came a similar situation where you had the 2600 7800 sega had the master system mega drive um, and obviously the mega drive had the same advantage of the backwards compatibility as well albeit with an adapter so you know that that's that's, that's pretty mad that just shows how many of these were sold and uh, and, you know, this console really kept uh, Atari Corp going for a long time and allowed them to get stuff like the ST and the Lynx and all those great other products they released later to market. I think without this baby um, and its success, they would have been dead in the water again and they wouldn't have survived um, because they were really struggling, um, you know, with the debt and uh, everything to, to, before getting the ST to market. And, you know, and the ST wasn't an instant success in 1985 it was a very expensive machine so you know it, it was probably not until 87 88 that they really started selling the st in big numbers so uh the, the atari 2600 has a, a a massive part in atari's history it you know was almost the savior of the company in, in many ways and uh we have a lot to be thankful for And I think when you're buying 2600s today, the model you'll see the most on eBay, if you're looking, is this model. Uh, not necessarily the black one, but the, the, the junior. You'll see loads of juniors on eBay, uh, which shows how common they are. The juniors are a lot easier to find than the woodies. And I would be um, very surprised if the junior didn't sell far more than the woody did in the UK, especially. Um, but right across Europe because the, the the old original VCS was very very expensive uh, back then in this country and and most of Europe we were very much at home computers um, because they worked out a lot cheaper with, with, with using tapes I mean I think it was more expensive to buy a VCS than it was to buy a Spectrum so you know what were you going to buy a computer that could do everything or, or or a limited games console with very expensive games you know it was kind of a no-brainer for us so that's why you know consoles I don't think it really really took off um, probably until till the 2600 came along actually it was probably the first truly successful uh, you know really successful console in the UK um, and then obviously we had the explosion of, of, of the Mega Drive and then the SNES afterwards and the rest as they say is history but yes that's the, that's that's the Atari 2600 Junior uh, a great little console uh, a big piece of history okay if you're a purist you're going to prefer the old world grey model it has I suppose a lot more appeal in it being the original model it has the the iconic wood grain finish it's the one that they people just go back to you know the flashback consoles are modeled on that the new atari vcs they're modeling on that you know that's that's the model that the, the that everyone talks about but they forget the importance of this as well and uh, it was a big part of console history um atari's history and a great little machine that holds a hell of a lot of memories for me and uh that's about it really so i thank you for watching i hope you've enjoyed my look little look at the atari 2600 junior i'll see you all for another video very soon thanks for watching bye bye